He is an Israeli scholar of Arabic culture, fluent in Hebrew, Arabic, and English. He holds a PhD from Bar Ilan University and is a lecturer at Bar Ilan University and is an academic expert on the Israel Arab population. Dr. Kedar served for 25 years in the IDF military intelligence, where he specialized in Islamic groups, the political discourse of Arab countries, the Syrian domestic arena, and the Arabic press and mass media. Dr. Kedar is much known for his two stunning interviews on Al Jazeera TV, viewed by millions. Edwin Sanders of the Los Angeles Times described Dr. Kedar as one of the few Arabic-speaking Israeli pundits seen on Arabic satellite channels defending Israel. I am pleased to introduce Dr. Mordechai Kedar, a friend and a defender of the Jewish state. Ladies and gentlemen, Israel is a miracle. Israel is a miracle because Israel exists for 70 years already against all odds. If we try to trace the background which Israel came from, let's say the, towards the end of the 19th century, where the Zionist organization started to operate. The first Zionist conference was in 1897, towards the end of the 19th century. The Jewish people are not a people. That time, there were communities, separate, fragmented, and every community tries to survive in its place, whether it's Baghdad, Tehran, Europe, of course, Poland, Germany, South Africa. People, Jews, did not have the awareness of a nation. There were communities, local communities, with different languages, different foods. You know, a Jew in Hungary eats goulash. And a Jew in Baghdad eats amba. <laughs> and the one who eats amba will never eat goulash. <laughs> and one who eats goulash will never eat amba. Because they don't like these foods which not theirs sang different songs, wore different clothing, couldn't even speak to each other. Because Jews who lived in Arab countries spoke Judeo-Arabic, Jews who lived in Europe spoke Yiddish, and those who lived in Spanish countries spoke Ladino. They couldn't even have any conversation with them, let alone to develop some kind of togetherness, separate. And do, don't forget that the communications which we have today, telephone, WhatsApp, <laughs> Telegram, nothing of the sort, not even call telephone with a dial. Maybe letters which people could write and send it. Maybe it will arrive, maybe not. Go and make a nation out of these communities. Totally impossible. Then they started to act. And there was opposition within the communities. There was opposition to the Zionist organization. Because people thought because of various reasons, from a religious point of view, from a for communist point of view, because many Jews took part in local political activities, in plural. Thank you so much. Jews were the first communists, Trotsky.
Jews were nationalists in other places. Jews were immersed in local politics. So why the heck should we change and become what? One nation? When, when were we one nation? After 2,000 years of exile, of living, wherever we survived, we lost the awareness of one nation. This is one thing. The second thing, the number of Jews at that time, at the beginning of the 20th century, who actually, who actually visited Israel, the land of Israel, which was then called Palestina, Palestina, was a handful. It was a direction of, of a prayer. It was in the prayers. It was hope, eschatological hope, something which should wait until the end of time when God will change the whole world, then we'll get back to Zion. It was never a realistic plan of anyone. To the maximum, Jews asked to be buried with a pillow, little pillow of sand which was brought from Eretz Israel under their head, in their grave, wherever they were, 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 were uh, uh, put in the, in the earth. This is the maximum which Jews allowed themselves to dream, to be buried with little sand from Eretz Israel under their head. Didn't think about going there. Not only this, the fact that that land belongs to us as the land of the Jews was not in their awareness. Who knows where it is? Who knows what, where is his part of the land? We lost the connection through 2,000 years of exile, 2,000 years of pogroms, 2,000 years of holocausts. Ben-Gurion described the Jewish nation at the beginning of the state as, in Hebrew, avak adam, human dust, small, fragmented, without any awareness of nationhood, of togetherness. Then came the First World War. Britain, France, occupied the Middle East from the Ottoman Empire. And this was the opportunity. Because, and here is another very important element of the, of the Zionist organization, the founders, the founding fathers of the Zionist organization understood from the beginning that they must do whatever they do in order to promote their cause with the international community, based on the international community. They asked Britain to declare that this country, means Palestine, Palestina, will be for the Jews, and of course, Balfour, 1917, recognizes as a minister of foreign affairs of the British Empire. Yet, something between the organization and the British Empire. But it was enough. The Zionist organization decided to bring it up to the international community, to the organization which, were, which preceded the United Nations, the League of Nations, which worked between the two world wars. And the League of Nations in San Remo, Italy, April 1920, decided to endorse the Balfour Declaration and to give the land between the river and the sea to the Jewish people as a decision of the international community, not as a decision only of the government of Her Majesty, but as an international community. And this actually what made the difference because it enabled Britain and the United States of America to have another agreement, the Anglo-American agreement about Pal Palestine, which made this decision of San Remo an American law. 
in, in a status of American law, means any American today who talks about occupation actually acts against the American law, which endorsed this decision of the League of Nations as an American law. Bear it in mind. So when you talk about occupation, we have to remember this. How can a nation, how can a nation occupy a land which was its land 2,000 years ago already and was recognized as its land by the international community embodied by the League of Nations of 1920? The definition of occupation cannot be implement, implemented on such a situation. How can, be, how can one be an occupier of his own land? Then, the United Nations, 1947, after the war, after the Holocaust, decided the partition plan to divide the, state, the country between Arab state and Jewish state. Nobody then talks about, talked about Palestinians. And then, after 1948, the recognition of many, many states in the world at, at Israel as a state with an international status of a legitimate state. Just to compare, there is a much bigger ethnic group, bigger than the Jews, which does not have a state. I'm talking about the Kurds. The Kurds, until this very day, do not have a state. They are divided between Syria, Iraq, Turkey, and Iran. And the reason is that they neglected the international community. First, we'll not, not get into the reasons, but they did not think that it is important to approach the British, to approach the, United, the League of Nations, to approach later the the, UN, the United Nations, in order to have the international support for their plea, or plight to a state. And this is why, until this very day, they are still struggling for liberation in all these four countries. The Zionist organization understood that without having the world with us, it will be much more difficult. However, when we talk about Britain, we have to give here a footnote, just for the memory. Britain blocked, against the mandate which they got in 1923, they blocked the seashores of Palestine so Jews will not be able to come from Europe especially, before the war, from the Second World War, during the Second World War, and after the Second World War, until 1948. Ladies and gentlemen, the Nazis most probably would not have exterminated six million Jews if those Jews could be expelled to the land of Israel, Palestine. Ladies and gentlemen, the Nazis decided on the mass extermination of Jews only in 1941, two years after the eruption of, of the war, because they had some hopes that other countries will take the Jews, United States, Canada, Argentina, Russia, or other countries. You remember the ship, St. Louis, before the war, which wandered with 900 Jews who ran away from Germany and was chased out from every harbor around the Atlantic in this country as well. So the Nazis understood that no country wants them and the British do not let them come to Palestine. So let's guess them to death. If Britain allowed the Jews to come to Palestine of those days, most probably, there wouldn't be the Holocaust, or not, at least not in this magnitude as it, would, as it was. 
The world, unfortunately, doesn't remember this when it comes to the responsibility. Of course, I'm not trying to, to give reduction to the Nazis for what they did, but the British could prevent it. However, when we talk about us, about the Jewish people, after the Holocaust, the situation was much, much worse. People were looking for what to eat, what to wear in the European winter. Go make a state out of them. Jews never fought. They never were soldiers. Of course, there were some in the German army and in the French army during the First World War, and Jews were fighting actually one each other in these armies. But in general, Jews were not trusted to be soldiers. How can you make an army out of people who never knew how to shoot? So all the givens, all the situation which preceded the state of Israel was so far from enabling these people to make a state to a degree that it was viewed by many as mission impossible. Even here, the American president, Truman, he thought that it will be a mass massacre if Israel declares the, uh, independence in the, uh, May 19, uh, 1948. He was afraid. This is why he tried to prevent it. Because he knew the situation of the Jews. And out of goodwill, he tried to postpone it. Okay. So this was actually the situation in the beginning. Fires could be from any ability to establish a state, not to mention the opposition of the neighbors of the state of Israel who threatened to slaughter all the Jews if they come to Israel. And they did it. 1920, 1921, 1929. All these massacres in Hebron, in Tzfat, in Tveria, Yafo, Jerusalem was before the occupation, before the state was established. And what they shouted of those days and later in the war as well, the Idbah el Yahud slaughtered the Jews, not the Israelis, not the Zionists, the Jews. The problem is the religion, at least in their eyes. And this is, this was the day which the state was declared at the end of the British mandate. The chances, if we look today, backwards, 70 years, if we now had to assess the ability of such a state to sustain when six Arab armies armed to, it, to their teeth with tanks, with artillery, with air forces, and here comes the role of the volunteers. Who can see such a thing? And of course, the result of that war was the 1%, one percent, one out of hundred of the Jews who lived in Israel at those times got killed in the war. Six thousand people got killed out of 600,000, more or less. After the war, another problem. The shores are open. Jews are coming in big influx from Europe especially, but not only. From Europe especially, from camps of displaced people. Now they can come, and they can come in big numbers. The number of Jews who came to Israel between 1948 and 52 was bigger than the number of the Jews who lived in Eretz Israel until that day. Just imagine, United States, how many? 300 million people live here? Three, let's say, that America gets an immigration of 300 million people within four years into this country, and America has to absorb them. Just imagine. It's the same thing? No. It's much easier here, because the economy here works. There are, you know, the economies. 
something which works. You can maybe do something. In Israel, what economy? What worked? It was under war. So absorbing a number of migrants, bigger than the number of the people who lived in, 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 in the land of that time, step impossible, totally impossible. And we did it. Israel did it to a degree that even food had to be divided. Not everybody could buy as much food as they needed. I was born in 1952. My mother, because I was born, she got the permission to buy another egg one, once a week. Because she had another, another boy, another newborn myself. We had coupons to buy. Money was not enough. There was a tsena and kitsuv, as we call it. And every couple of years, 48, 56, 67, another war, another war, because our neighbors have not yet agreed to our existence. The price was tremendous. <coughs> Yesterday, today actually, we commemorated more than 24,000 people who fell in the wars since 1851 the first casualty in the land of Israel, both in the army and terror attacks as well. There is almost no family in Israel who doesn't know one member of the family or a friend of the family who fell on the struggle to survive in such a place. Ladies and gentlemen, it's not only this. What the state did during the 70 years is total change. We started as a state of economy of oranges, Jaffa oranges. <laughs> we were so proud. Ship, another ship, leaves the harbor of Ashdod and Haifa with so many boxes, goes to Europe, goes to America. We were so proud. Today, High tech. This is what we what we export today. High tech security, things that the world needs. Israel is at the, the, the front line of the high tech worldwide. Yesterday I was in San Francisco. There was a giant conference of high tech companies which deal with security. Seventy thousand people came to San Francisco to a giant conference. The Israel is there. They were not the majority, but compared, compared to the size of Israel in the world and the number of residents of, in Israel, Israel was like 200 times bigger than its size globally. Not to mention the prizes, the Nobel prizes, which Jews and Israelis take part in. But I think that the biggest achievement of the state of Israel was different. The biggest achievement was not only to take Jews out of exile, it's to take exile out of the Jews. <laughs> From people who do not have any awareness of togetherness, they made them one fist. From people who cannot even talk to each other because they speak different languages, to people who speak Hebrew, a language which went through a process of resurrection, no less. Because Hebrew was the language only of the liturgic events and the best Midrash. Today, Hebrew is the language of the science in Israel. The builders speak in Hebrew and they write plants in Hebrew. Everything is in Hebrew. The media, even the thieves <laughs> speak Hebrew. <laughs> the world does not know a precedent of a language which served until 2,000 years ago and came back to life 
after it was in the museum of the yeshiva. Unprecedented. Jews today do not consider themselves as people who came from Poland, like my parents, or Baghdad, or Yemen, or America, or whatever. And this is very hard, because it is very easy to take a Jew out of exile from Lux to TLV, 16 hours, and the mission accomplished. But to take the exile of the Jew, it needs a generation, no less. Look, my own family. My wife, Raina, she was born in New York. She grew up in Brooklyn, Massachusetts. And she still parks her car in Harvard Yard. <laughs> Harvard Yard. Our children, when they speak English, they speak like Israelis. This is a change. When they were small kids, at the age of three, four, they never answered her in English in the street, only in Hebrew. They felt that speaking English in the public sphere doesn't fit. Nobody told them. Nobody prevented them from speaking in English. But they felt something in the air that you should speak Hebrew, that mother is speaking English, okay, because she speaks English. At home, yes. At home, they answered in English. Perfect English. Not outside. This is what I mean, taking exile out of the Jews, because she has no problem to speak in English. In Ra'anana, where I live, it's hard to get along with Hebrew. <laughs> well, it's okay. You can. Many English speakers came to Ra'anana because they like to be with each other. They still have book club for English speaker girls, you know, of the 65 years old girls. Okay, let them have it. Our children do not think in this. They are Israelis. And you can see it very well in the most important criterion of togetherness, which is the weddings, the shiduchim, the matchmaking. Look, I have five children, um, two daughters and three sons. My first daughter, look, my parents came from Poland. Raina's parents, Americans, uh, her father came, is actually a Yaki, came from Leipzig <laughs> in Germany, and her mother's family came from Russia a hundred years ago to this country. Okay, our two daughters are married. The first one is married to a boy whose mother is from Herat in Afghanistan, and his father is from Bukhara, all the way to the east. Uh, the, sec the other daughter is married to a boy whose mother is from Tunisia and his father is from Morocco, Marrakesh. Okay? And this is what Israel is about. We don't anymore think about Polish and American and Bukhari or whatever. We are Israelis. And this is, I think, the hardest and the biggest achievement. The hardest challenge, <laughs> from people who ran away from pogroms to people who fight, from people who lived on others' expense to a flourishing economy with one of the hardest and the most powerful currencies in the world, the shekel which only goes up all the time. Real estate in Israel, very expensive, and gets more expensive every other day, because many people buy assets in Israel. And believe me, people would not buy anything in a country which doesn't have prospects of future. People have confidence, and the biggest uh, uh, proof for confidence and optimism in Israel is, I'll tell you what. First of all, there is a, we are a, a member of the OECD, uh, the Organization of the Developed Countries. And every year, Israel comes out 
as the first uh, state with satisfaction of the people. Madad HaOsher, the standard of happiness. Israelis are not drug, on drugs, but they are happy. <coughs> Addiction to alcoholic beverages and, uh, and drugs is the lowest in Israel compared to the other countries of the OECD. The consumption of medications in Israel, the lowest. Life expectancy in Israel is the highest within the OECD countries. Something goes well there. Of course, we have criticism on everything. We complain about everything, because this is our nature. Maybe we brought it from the Golas. But the bottom line is that Israel is a story of success from all the standards, while, just to compare our neighbors, our story of failure. Just look at Syria. Look at how a vicious, barbaric, satanic regime guesses his own citizens. Guesses. Remember? Uh, how sects are killing each other in Iraq, Sunnah and Shia, and Kurds and Arabs, and tribes in Libya, and tribes in Yemen, and Iran is taking state after state, and the Arabs cannot do anything against it. Total failure around us. And when we, when we see, we don't like it. We actually are very worried about our neighbors, what happens in Syria. And there is even support which we give them behind the scenes. Nobody talks about this. Recently it was revealed. There is an organization, organization named Israel Flying Aid, run by a lady named Gabi Luski. She went to Syria during the last seven years, who knows how many times, a lady. And she has workers. Arabs, Arab citizens in Israel who speak Arabic and they give what they give to the poor people in Syria wherever they, they can arrive. Israel doesn't announce it. We know about this. We are very worried about what happens around us because the chaos around us enables the Iranian regime to collect the Arab countries ke'esof be'itzim azuvot as somebody who collects abandoned eggs from the, from the ground. Iran already controls Yemen, Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon. And it's not the end of the list. Their aspirations are way beyond. They include Saudi Arabia and Israel. And this is actually what makes Saudi Arabia our new Arab friend after we already have peace agreement with Egypt and with Jordan. Ladies and gentlemen, Israel not only survived in the wars, Israel succeeded to force our neighbors to give us peace. And peace, of course, in the Middle East means long truce or long, cease, long ceasefire. No hugs, no kisses, it's okay. We can accept it. But they understood that Israel is invincible with a society which acts like an iron fist, with support from the world, which we made sure that we get, with support of communities, Jewish communities, which now have a center in Israel. Now they have something which unites them, and the economy. When you have all these elements together, you are invincible, of course, the army and the high tech, which the situation forced us to develop things in order to defend ourselves, especially when the French stopped the airplanes, which we bought and paid in 1967. They didn't, they didn't supply. So we had to build an, an, another airplane, the La Vie. Of course, the La Vie was not produced on a large scale, but it gave uh, the, I, the Israeli uh, aircraft industries a boost because of this project. So the situation of boycotted by France actually promoted the Israeli high-tech. 
people do not usually connect it, but this was. I highly encourage you to read a book, uh, uh, Startup start Nation. Startup Nation, how these people succeeded to promote the Israeli high tech. Ladies and gentlemen, Israel is a story of success, not only because of our neighbors who are stories of failures, of failure. Israel is a story of success because it should have been a failure, taking the situation of the end of the 19th century. It could not be a success if you take in account what we were only 120 years ago. We did the impossible. And when the impossible is done, this is called a miracle. And this is why the state of Israel is a miracle. The existence of the state of Israel is a miracle. And the fact that we stand here now, 70 years after it was established, and 120 years or more after the Zionist organization started its activity, in order to celebrate the 70th uh, birthday of the State of Israel, this is the embodiment of the miracle. The only reason is the Oz means the inner strength which we found in our souls, which was hiding there for 2,000 years, which we could use it when the day came. Hashem Oz le'amo iten. Hashem yivarech et amo b'shalom. God will give us all strength. And this is how God will give us all peace. Thank you so much.